Amen. Lord bless you as you find your way back to your seat. Praise the Lord. Each Sunday in January, we have been able to just look at the next passage of Scripture as we found it in the book of Matthew and, uh, and, and discover things in Scripture that we should be dedicating ourselves to as we look at the beginning of a new year, uh, January being the beginning of 2020. What we found just in Scripture is that uh, for us, if we dedicate ourselves to these passages, that this should be the year of bearing fruit. This should be the year of us knowing Christ and dedicating ourselves to increasing our knowledge of Christ. This should be the year of wisdom, uh, what uh, Tim preached for us last Sunday. And this year, or this this week, we're going to look at, this will be the year of His authority and our amazement. So we're going to be reading in Matthew chapter 7, the last two verses of the chapter. And this is what it says, Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. It says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at His teaching. That's uh, if Jesus is my example. Man, that's some high and lofty, like, I don't know if that's I don't, know if, I don't know if I'll ever attain to that level of when I finish speaking, you'll be amazed at my teachings, but I'll try. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at the teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So this is an interesting little passage of Scripture here. It says, when he had finished saying these things, well, the, the, these things that he had just finished talking about is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's a passage of Scripture that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus had a large group of people that were there for Him to teach. He went up on the side of a mountain where He could use the, the natural trajectory of the terrain to amplify His voice so that the large crowd could hear Him as He spoke. He didn't have a PA system and a microphone like we have today. And so uh, he, he was using the terrain that he made, that he spoke into existence as an amplification system so that he could teach the people. And so he, he taught this sermon, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and he did it in one sitting to where he just taught the people. When he had finished saying these things, these things, we have been studying these three chapters of the Bible for over 30 weeks. We had finished saying these things, like there's not a lot, like it just kind of breezes over it, right? When he finished saying these things, it's taken us over 30 weeks for us to look at and process through and apply to our lives and reason together the, the will of God as it pertains to us through these scriptures. He preached this one sermon, and we have looked at this one sermon for over 30 weeks. That's um, two-thirds of a year. One of, the, uh, one of the times that Pastor Ted Miller was here preaching, he said that he had once been told that if we could just live the Sermon on the Mount, if that was the only part of the Bible that we got, understood, and applied, then we would live very godly and righteous lives. And I think that's true. There's a lot that is contained within these three chapters of the Bible. This passage that we just read said that the people were amazed because he taught as one who had authority. So Jesus teaches and he's establishing his expectations for his followers within his kingdom. We know that on his first journey through Galilee, excuse me, he was preaching that the kingdom of heaven is near, and that this journey through Galilee, he's actually setting his expectations for if you're going to be a part of this kingdom, if you want to be a part of my followers, here is what I expect from you. And so he's just laying out some guidelines. He's, he's laying out some things. Some of it was just like tweaks in their understanding of Scripture. Some of it was completely different from what they had been taught. In fact, he even led into some of it with, hey, listen, I know you've been taught this, but what I actually want you to know is this over here. I know you've heard this 
said, and they heard it said from their teachers of the law and their religious leaders. This wasn't just like, I know that, I know lying, lying Bob over there keeps telling you these things, but no one needs to listen to lying Bob. He's a liar. Now he got his nickname. Don't even listen to that guy. Like, this is not what he's talking about. He's telling them things that they had heard in church, that they had listened to as people had come in to teach them the Holy Scriptures of God. And he's saying, you've heard it this way, but that's not that way at all. It's actually this way in my kingdom. And so something he was just flipping them completely on their heads and just reteaching them the truths that he wanted them to know. And so this was, this was his introduction, if you will, to how to live within the kingdom of heaven. This was his introduction to his expectations of his followers. And it says that he taught as one who had authority. So the question for us today is, will we submit our lives to his authority? The reason he could teach is one that has authority is because he actually had the authority. Um, when I was a youth pastor, we had a guy in for a service, and um, after he was done, I said, "Man, you, you, you did a really good job. That was a really good sermon." And he said, "Ah, you know, I don't, I don't know. My grandpa once told me that if you're not really certain about your sermon." You can just talk really loud and really fast, and it makes people think you know what you're talking about. Um, he was speaking as one who had authority, but apparently didn't really believe that he had the authority, right? The reason that Jesus can speak as one who has authority is because he does. When Jesus speaks, things happen. When Jesus says something, it still be done. I mean, he, he's the one that the Bible tells us that as God spoke creation into existence, Jesus was the one that was the active force directing the Holy Spirit's work so that everything actually came into being. And John chapter 1 tells us that nothing was made that has been made without Him. Through Him, all things were made. So He was the force, the power behind creation. So when He speaks, creation has to listen. He's the only guy on earth ever that can tell the water to support his weight and walk on it. Because he's Jesus. The authority that he has is real authority. And so when the Bible says they were amazed because that he taught as one that has authority. This was their introduction. This was them listening to him and saying, wow, that, that's completely different. This is completely revolutionary. This is amazing. And he taught us this. He had authority because he actually had authority. And he still has authority today. So the question is, will we submit ourselves to his authority? Are we willing to give the authority that we can walk around? You can, you can have your own life. You can do your own thing. You can make your own decisions. And you can even try your best to make good decisions. You can do what you think seems right. But here's what the Bible says about that. There is a way that seems good to man, but in the end, it leads to death. So even in your best, most valiant, most wise efforts, if you don't have the authority of God that is leading your life, if you're not submitting your will to His will, where you're headed is not where you want to wind up. Jesus still has authority today. And the question is, will we submit ourselves to His authority In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is giving us his expectations for us as followers or as productive members of his kingdom. In chapter 5, he teaches us largely how we should interact with each other. In chapter 6, he's teaching us largely how we should be interacting with God. In chapter 7, it kind of goes back and forth in an effort to teach us that the way that we interact with others will and can impact the way that we interact with God. And the way that we interact with God can and will impact the way that we interact with others. If, um, if, if 
if I'm completely hateful to everyone around me, it greatly reduces the possibilities of God listening to my request for help. If I am manipulative and I take advantage of people and I view people as means to an end, and this is my modality of life, then, then God is not going to elevate me to any kind of level of position. How do I know that? The Bible tells us. But if I, if I spend enough time in the presence of God to understand that He's God and that He does the things that He wants to do and that I am under Him and that I am just His servant and this brings a, a level of humility to my life and then that that humility is then spread to where I just want to serve other people, then when I approach God, then there's this uh, conduit to which God can use me to do the things that He wants to do. How I interact with people will impact the way that I interact with God, and how I interact with God will impact the way that I interact with people. This is the summation of these three chapters. So how does the life of submission to the authority of Jesus look? How does it look for us to take these three chapters of the Bible and for us to say, let's live this. Let's get this. If all we get in life is the Sermon on the Mount, if we could just live this, then we would be crushing it as disciples of Jesus Christ. How can we do this? What does it look like? Here's the first thing that we notice. You can see our submission to Jesus in the way that we interact with others. This is simply a summation of chapter 5. The way that we interact with others will reveal whether or not we are submitted to Christ. You see, here's the thing about Christ. He loves that person that you're interacting with to the point of giving himself on a cross for them. He thinks so highly of them that he was willing to sacrifice himself to give his own very life for them. And and not in a way that was quick and painless. In a way that was very slow and agonizing. And he still was willing to endure it. Not just for you, but for every person that you see. Some people may choose to reject that, sure, but the offer is always on the table for them. We should be able to see our level of submission to Jesus by the way that we interact with others. Jesus began this sermon by giving us what we call the Beatitudes. There are nine blessed statements. The word that Jesus uses here is, uh, is a macaroy, and uh, this is in the, the plural form of this word. Just in the form, Jesus is teaching us something. But he wasn't listing, listing out nine specific people groups that will be blessed. Okay, if you can fit into one of these groups. He wasn't speaking about each group in the individual. This was a, a plural. He was listing nine characteristics of people who are blessed as his followers. If you are blessed, you will have these nine characteristics. If not, if you fit into one of these nine people groups, you will be blessed. If every follower of Christ has this blessing available to them, if they will if they will allow God to produce these nine characteristics within their lives. That word actually literally means fully satisfied. Jesus was speaking prophetically that those who follow him would be fully satisfied by him as they see that he is the blessing. And when they are fully satisfied by him, even in these life, uh, life circumstances, they will be blessed. Here's what we learn from this. Every teaching of Jesus is not given us so that we would know how to live. I'm going to let that sink in because for me, for some of you, this is a this is a Jesus moment where I'm telling you, you've heard it said this. God gives us a road map. You've heard it said. And what I'm telling you is that's not actually true at all. Because the Bible's not about you. The Bible's not about your way. It's not about your journey. It's not about your trip. It's not a map for you. We 
when Jesus is teaching us these things, He's not telling us everything that we're to do in every circumstance. Every teaching of Jesus is given us so that we know God. It's His story. The Bible is not a road, just a roadmap for us. The Bible is a revelation of the nature and the character of God. And as we know God, as we understand Him, as we devote ourselves to learning and growing in our knowledge of who He is, then we see His nature, we see His character, and in our aspirations to be like Him, then we know what to do in every circumstance because of what He would do and because of what He wants done. So if I just look at the Bible as a roadmap for me, then I'm making the Bible out to be about me, and it's not. What Jesus is teaching us is, this is who God is. And as I know who God is, then I know what to do in light of who He is. By knowing God, we discover what kind of kingdom Jesus came to establish. And by knowing what kind of kingdom He came to establish, we know what is expected of us as members of that kingdom. Why should we be honest people? Because God is truth. Why should we be loving people? Because God is love. Why should we be gracious people? Because God is the issuer of grace. Why should we extend mercy to people? Because God extended mercy to us. We can go through any life circumstance. Why should I do the wise thing? Why should I not cut these corners and cheat people? Why should I not be manipulative? Why should I see people as the jewels that Christ sees them as? And, and the answer to all of them is because this is who God is. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. He is the blessing of those who live a blessed life. It is Him. It is a relationship with Him. It is knowing Him. It is Him that is the blessing. Jesus was telling us who God is. And when we know God and we know that God is our blessing, it doesn't matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. We know what to do. We know how to act. Because we're going to act in ways that are in keeping with who God is. This led Jesus' discussion about how how we are to interact with others. Because if we are fully satisfied in Him, then we don't need anything from anyone else. There was very... Uh, there was a lot of intentionality in the way that Jesus designed everything that he did. So the reason that he led uh, chapter 5, his, his portion of his sermon about this is how we interact with others, this is the reason that he front and loaded it with this, because he wants us to know that if we are fully satisfied, that we don't need anything from anyone else. And when we don't need anything from anyone else, we can, be look, but we can look to be a blessing instead of looking as to what we can get from them. It changes the way that we interact with people. It changes us from the mentality of, okay, what's in it for me? Into a mentality of, hey, if there's nothing in it for me, if I can still be a blessing, I want to be a blessing. Heaven knows that God didn't look at me and say, I'm going to save that guy, because there's a lot in it for me. No, that's not how that works. He just acted in grace and in love and in kindness and in compassion and in mercy. Because that's who He is. And as we understand these things about Him to be true, then they should be true about us. And then there's this formative work that we allow the Holy Spirit to do in our hearts and lives. And as there's this formative work that takes place, it changes the way that we interact with people. And it becomes no longer about me and what I can get and what I need. It becomes all about them and how can I give my life away in the same way that Jesus did. This is why in chapter 5, after explaining the blessed life and what it looks like, Jesus moves immediately from these blessed statements into telling His followers that they are to be salt and light. 
salt and light are two illustrations of giving. Salt gives flavor. But it wasn't just about flavor in those days. In those days, they didn't have freezers, they didn't have refrigerators, and so a salt crust would do two things. It was preserved by seeking out and destroying harmful bacteria. So whatever it was that was creating decay, it would seek it out and it would destroy it to prevent decay. But then the other thing that it would do is it would uh, it would prevent any new bacteria from attaching to whatever it was uh, that it was crusting to preserve. This is an active role, not a passive role. This means that we as Christ followers, that we can't just sit back idly by and say, oh, I don't know, oh, well, here comes this person, I see they have a need, and so yeah, I can take care of that. But the word to be actively engaged in the world around us, in the community around us, looking for opportunities to be a blessing to people. That we are to, to take our seat at the table of the communities that we serve and be willing to say, hey, with Christ's help, I can help with that. Because God has been good to me, I can be faithful in this. This is the reason that we do things like pass out free bottles of water at the Okanigan tournament. The chief of police told us this last time that uh, he doesn't know that there's no way for him to quantify how much money that we save them. And not just in that they don't have to buy water, but in the fact that they're not calling, being called out to every person who just passes over um, flat out drunk and with no means of uh, of moisture. Sometimes it just needs some good moisture. Yeah, hydration would be the right word. It's been a long week. I need some moisture. <laughs> uh, so, salt. So, it seeks out and it prevents. And this is our active role as Christ followers. We seek out what is bringing decay into the communities around us. What is bringing decay into society around us? We seek that out and we do our part to, to make sure that we are preserving any amount of righteousness and holiness. And, and, and even if it's not righteousness and holiness, even if it's good, that we are seeking out and that we are preserving that what is good. It's, it's this active reason that we, that we did things like call Winnie Wood and say, hey, can we give every student in your elementary school a pair of shoes for free? We're seeking out and we're preserving what is good. Kids need shoes. We can provide shoes. We had an opportunity to do this and so we took advantage of it. It wasn't for us. We didn't seek glory out of it. We weren't plaster and everything all over social media for decades. We don't want to be known as a shoe-given church. Like, we're not, we're not in it for us. This was a need that we had access to fill, and so we filled it. Because this is what an active role looks like. We're being salt. We're being light. Light invades the darkness. And it does not take very much light to push back a lot of darkness. And the more light there can be, the less darkness there is. They cannot coexist. The Bible teaches us that. Where there is light, there cannot be darkness. We are the light of the world. The light of Jesus is inside of us. And as the light, we are to be invading dark spaces, taking the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the dark spaces of the world around us. And when we do, the darkness is pushed back. Because where there is light, there cannot be darkness. This is the active role that Jesus wants us to take. This is what he's teaching us through uh, these teachings. He's saying, here is a blessed life that you can have. That he is the blessing. And that when we're blessed, we're fully satisfied by him. We don't approach the world as if we need something. And when we don't approach the world as if we need something, we can just be salt and we can be light. As we walk through the remainder of chapter 5, we see that when we are fully satisfied by Christ, it changes the way that we interact with those around us in these, these specific ways. It changes the way that we look at God's expectations of us. And that we understand that, that He expects us to be usable by Him and to be reaching into the lives of the people around us. It changes the way that we view the sanctity of human life, placing value on souls, murder, 
abortion. These things are things that we are against. Why? Because there is a value that is placed on human life. It changes the way that we view members of the opposite sex. They are not ours for consumption, but rather they are souls that deserve our respect. It changes the way that we view our spouse as relationships are not disposable. It changes the way that we commit ourselves, causing us to keep our word when we make a commitment and understanding that what we say matters. It changes the way that we view those who wrong us, not only uh, not seeking vengeance and allowing God to be the one who defends us, but also moving us to a place where we can actually have and display love for our enemies. It's one thing to say, my hands are clean, get them, God. But it's quite another thing to move beyond the vengeance stage to say, hey, look, I know that you wronged me, but can I show you this kindness? Listen, I know that you have wronged me. I know what you've said about me. I know what you've done. I know what you've said what's happened behind my back. I know the injury that's taken place. I know that you cheated me. But God's still giving me an insight to a need that I can meet. And, and not because of you, but because of God. Let me show you this kindness. Let me, let me walk in love. And this only takes place if we're living lives fully satisfied by Christ. And if I've got something that I need from someone else, then I can't get to the point where I'm looking to bless those who have persecuted me. I can't get to the point where I'm looking to love those who have wronged me because I need something for myself. But when I'm fully satisfied with Christ, then it doesn't matter what they've done because of God's faithfulness and because of God's goodness, I can continue to be a blessing. We will only ever achieve that by submitting fully to Christ and His way of life. Here's the second thing that we that we look at. Uh, You can see our submission to Jesus in the way that we interact with God. So here we are in chapter six. So so in chapter five, you should see our submission to Jesus in the way that we interact with others. It is revealed by the way that we interact with others. This is the same thing is true. You should see our submission by the way that we interact with God. Jesus began what we have in chapter 6 with a transitional statement about the way that we give to the needy and how it shows the correlation to what God has given us. But these things are related. The, the, way that we, the way that we give to the other people around us as He's moving us from chapter 5 to interact with other people as if you are fully satisfied and fully submitted to His authority, but understand that there's a, a correlation here, and now we're going to move into how we interact with God. And then He moves from there into teaching us how we should be people of prayer, teaching us how we should pray. In the same way that being fully satisfied in Christ will change and alter the way that we interact with other people, being people of prayer will change the way that we interact with the God of of prayer. The more we become people of prayer, the less we want anything to get in the way of our prayer time. This is where regular fasting comes in, as this is just kind of walking through chapter 6. Fasting is removing the distractions so that we can focus solely on prayer, focus solely on God. And so when we become people of prayer, like he's telling us to in the beginning of chapter 6, then this is a very natural transition for us to, hey, that's getting in the time of my prayer time. I don't want that. I'm going to remove this from my life. I'm going to go without this for a time so that I can devote myself more, more completely and more fully to my prayer time. As you walk through the rest of chapter 6, Jesus tells us that the more we interact with God through prayer, the more we will set our minds on heavenly things, and the less we will set our minds on earthly things. So the things that that once were were shiny and cool and distracting to us are no longer distracting to us. The, The things that once consume our time, that consume our thoughts, no longer consume our time or our thoughts that our thoughts are on the things above, that our time is devoted to things above. The more we pray, the more God's things matter than our things. 
prayer is the key for us understanding the, the light of the gospel and allowing that light to invade the dark places. If we can't be people of prayer, then we can know that light should invade the dark places, but we don't know how that works for us. We don't know what our part is in that. We know that it should be done. We know that we should be doing it. But there's no direction. There's no purpose. There's no outlet for us to be the light in the dark places. But as we devote ourselves to prayer, to conversational relationship with God, to where we are putting our our, our thoughts out there and we're listening to the thoughts of God, He begins to give us direction as to how exactly uh, we do what He wants us to do. Prayer will build our relationship with God to the point where we trust Him enough not to worry as we just continue to walk through chapter 6. This is a hard one. Because I don't know about you, but there are a lot of things in this life that don't go the way that I want them to. I've learned this hard truth. Nothing ever works out like you play it in your head. And when it doesn't work out like you play in your head, it gives opportunity to worry. If things aren't happening the way that that you think that they should, it provides opportunity to worry. But even in the midst of uncertainty, even when it's not happening the way that you think it should, our prayer life, if it's strong enough to sustain us in those times, can help us step back in a just complete peace and say, God, it's not how I wanted it to go, but I'm going to trust in your plans. I'm going to trust in your goodness. I've seen you in the past be able to do amazing things. I've heard your voice, and I know what you're calling me to. And because of that, I don't have to worry about this. I'm just going to trust that you are at work. And like we sang about today, even when we can't see it, He's working. Even if you don't feel it, He's working. Because he never stops working. And, and our prayer life can connect us to him to the point where we can just step back from life's frustrating circumstances and say, Hey, God, I don't get it, but I get you, and I trust you. And I don't know what's taking place around me. I don't know why this isn't going the way that I wanted it to, but I'm not going to be worried about it. I'm just going to trust in you, and I'm going to see your goodness. Instead of worrying about ourselves, we'll be more concerned with his kingdom and His righteousness. Here's the third thing that we learned. You should see our submission to Jesus in the way that our interactions with others and with God play off of each other. So we can't just be focused on interacting with people. We can't just be focused on interacting with God. There's this play within the, the, each other where, where they kind of play off of each other, and we have to know this and understand this. And you can see if we're fully submitted to Jesus and His authority by the way that these things interact with each other. This is largely chapter 7. When we interact with those that are a little bit different than us, do we get angry or spiteful? Does it break our hearts out of compassion for their lost state? Which direction do we go? When we see people and they don't do it the way that we want it done, or they don't do it the way that we think should be done, when even if they're doing it in a way that we find distasteful and displeasing, do we, do we view them with spite and disdain? do we view them through eyes of love and grace? Are we expecting non-Christians to act like Christians? I, uh, I watched, I probably shouldn't have, but I watched a little bit of the President's uh, impeachment hearings this week. And I read some things about it. And um, and here's what I know. To be true. The liberals expect the conservatives to act like liberals. And the conservatives expect the liberals to act like conservatives. And here's another thing that I can just tell you. This may be a revelation. I don't know. But liberals are going to act like liberals and conservatives are going to act like conservatives. And the fighting and the bickering that we see in that arena should not be the fighting and the bickering that we see in the arena of the church interacting with the community at large. 
And yet a lot of times we take the same approach. Well, this is our way of life. How dare you not have our way of life? You don't want our way of life? You go that way. I'm going to stay here this way. And, and God, let it not be so. We view the world around us and we see the things that they do and, and we hear the things that they say and, and we look at their kind of music and their attire and the things that they're involved in and, we, and we're just disgusted and so and we just move on and just, uh, uh, just move it back. No, we're not doing that. Let's just devote ourselves to the reading of God's Word and being together where we're like each other and food should be involved. And that's the recipe for a lot of churches in America. And those churches that have that as a recipe will never impact the kingdom of God. They have taken their life and they put it under a bushel. No. But that's what they've done. And when we read the Word of God, this cannot be our story. When we read the Word of God, we have to be invading the dark spaces with the light of the gospel. We have to be the salt that preserves and that actively seeks out and destroys decay. This has to be our story. Because this is what Jesus wants. And as we interact with God, there can be nothing within us that says, pull back. As we interact with God, everything within us should be saying, because of our interaction with God, we engage community. We get involved in the things around us. Because of what God is doing in us, we, we want to be around other people where we can see the work of God in their lives as well. The way that we interact with God and the way that we interact with people, they have to play off each other. And if they don't, then we're not fully submitted to the authority of Christ. We're fully submitted to what we want from Christ. There are churches out there that they want people. That's what they want. They want numbers. They want notoriety. They want people. And they're willing to compromise their message. And they're willing to not say anything that might be offensive. They're willing to, to remove the sacred truths of Scripture and the things that saints have been doing for thousands of years. They're not fully submitted to the authority of Christ. They're fully submitted to what they want. Chapter 5. There are, there are churches that they're fully submitted to, to not the authority of Christ, but to, to the way they interact with God and preserving their traditions and making sure that the things that they do are, are in step and in keeping with the things that they've always done, and they don't want anybody rocking that boat. And if you're a person and you're going to come in and rock that boat, no, 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 no. You don't get to be in here. We're not boat rockers. And they're committed to what they want. And they would look at chapter 6 and say, man, this is our chapter. This is us. Yes, God, let it be. But they're not committed. They're not submitted to the authority of Christ. They're submitted to their way. If we're going to be fully submitted to the authority of Christ, there's a play between the two where we interact with God and we interact with the community. Where, where we want people, but we don't want people for our own glory and for our own notoriety. We want people to connect them to Christ because they need it. And we serve God and we love God and we have traditions and we have things that, that foster an atmosphere of worship and we do things like sing scriptures and read scriptures and pray scriptures and preach scriptures because this is what will not return void. But we do that for His glory so that it will impact those around us. There has to be a play within the two. And if there's no play within the two, then we're not fully submitted to the authority of Christ. We're submitted to our own desires. The more we understand the play between the two as we walk through chapter 7, we're less likely to judge people. We're more likely to allow God to be their judge. We're more likely to realize that, uh, that we shouldn't just be praying for ourselves. But when we ask, seek, and knock, there should be time where we're praying for other people around us, even people that sometimes we don't even know. We should have this opportunity to understand that we should ask and seek and knock for things that are of kingdom value, not just personal value. The more that we see God and the more that we understand the play between these two things, we seek out the small gate and the narrow path. We bear fruit. We know Christ more. We grow in wisdom. We submit to His authority. And when we submit to His authority, we will stand amazed at His work and involvement in our lives. This 
one of those sermons that I could have just been complete hype. I could have been. I could have taken a stool and hid it behind the wall. Right? I could have had you standing up and shouting me down. Because here is the crux of the message. In 2020, this can be the year that you are amazed by God. That He reveals Himself in ways that are mind-blowing and that are amazing. And may you never cease to be amazed at the bigness of God, at His glory, at His goodness, at His favor. At His mercy, His mercies are new every morning, and you will be amazed when you just look at Jesus. And yet, there's that other part. And the other part is, if you want this to be the year of amazement, it has to be the year of His authority. They weren't just amazed at Jesus because he was doing cool things. They weren't just amazed at Jesus because some little kid brought up just a couple loaves and a couple fish and boom, he fed 5,000 people, which is actually probably more like 20 or 30,000 people. We're not just amazed at what he does for us and what we get out of it. They were amazed because of his authority. And this is true for us today. If we live our lives in complete submission to His authority, we'll be amazed at what He does. We'll be amazed at what we get to be a part of. We'll be amazed. And I can tell you this is true from personal experience. I am nobody country boy from northwest Oklahoma. Almost Kansas. It sounds worse if you're almost from Kansas. It makes no difference. Oklahoma's Oklahoma, but I add that in it just because it sounds bad. And, and week after week, I get to rightly divide the word of truth to people I love. See God's faithfulness growth and life transformation. Not because of me, but I get to be a part of it because of God's goodness to me. And this can be the story of our lives, and this can be the story of 2020. And as we submit our lives to the authority of Christ, we'll be continually amazed. Can you stand with me? I'm going to close the service in prayer. We want it to be the year of bearing fruit, the year of knowing Christ, the year of wisdom, and the year of His authority and our amazement. And as we submit ourselves to His presence, that's what this can be. So I'm going to close the service out in prayer, and I'm going to pray that, that with God's help that we would be willing and able to submit ourselves to Him and to devote this year and the rest of our lives to pursuing Him and pursuing His uh, His kingdom and His glory. And I would just invite you to pray along with me. Father, we praise You and we thank You for Your Word, for the truths that are found inside, for the things that we get to, to learn and discover about You as we just open Your Word and discover what's inside. God, I pray that You would submit this in our lives that it's not just about us, it's not just about what we get out of it, but God, it's about you and your glory and your kingdom and your will. And God, I pray that your will would be done in our lives. I pray that we would press in firmly to your authority and that we would give you full reign of our lives and that we would walk in complete submission to whatever it is that you want to do in and through us. And God, as we do that, I know that you are faithful and that you will take what is offered to you freely and that you will use it and multiply it and then our efforts will become powerful and effective and we will see life change around us. We will see life happen around us. We will see life 
spread through the darkness, and the gates of hell pushed back by the kingdom of heaven. God, let that be his fear. And let that be our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Church, we love you guys. We're praying for you. Uh, don't forget giving records at the Connect Corner. And uh, we'll see you guys.